Hey guys, and welcome back to our series on using JASP. This is still part 11, but it's part two for part 11. So in the last video we did, <clears throat> excuse me, simple linear regression, and now we're gonna move on to multiple linear regression. So we're just gonna start with an example. If you need to watch that video, it explains more about multiple linear regression in comparison to simple linear regression at the very beginning. So now we're still trying to predict aerobic capacity which is an indicator of fitness and health. And so uh, normally that's kind of a hard thing to do, but instead we could rely on um, using some other ways to predict it, like things like you might have on a watch, for example. So I know my watch would allow me to guess at this estimate rather than sitting on a um, treadmill until I fell over. Okay. So we're going to base this on age, weight, and heart rate. So we're going to pull out the data here on JASP. Well, I thought it was. <laughs> Let's try again. <laughs> JASP. There we go. All right. So I'm going to click the hamburger icon, hit open, computer, and then find where you have these things saved. So this is in our folder for this course. Right, and this is our regression data. So we've got a bunch of things I can predict from here. Uh, case number really is just a participant number. We've got age, weight, and heart rate, and actually gender predicting maybe VO2 max. So we found the regression data. Now let's go through all the pieces that we need to. First thing, as usual, is to check assumptions. So the assumptions here is that the independent variables are continuous or nominal. Okay. Now we can actually do this with variables that have multiple categories, um, but in our example, we're mostly working with continuous data. Okay. Then the dependent variable also needs to be um, scale only. Okay. So here the IV can be either one, right? It can be continuous or nominal. Okay. So categories or a ratio or, or interval style scale, but the DV still has to be uh, continuous okay, in some form, so at least interval or ratio. Uh, the only section in our series here that that's not true is chi-square, and that's coming up next. Okay, so pretty much everything you normally do in an undergraduate statistics course um, is parametric statistics, which requires that DV to be continuous. All right, well, we can, um, there's, there should be another assumption here. <laughs> In order to check the assumptions, um, well, in order to check the next set of assumptions, so there's kind of a missing header here. Uh, okay, uh, because you don't check if it's independent or ratio by running a test, you just know, okay? Uh, not independent, interval or ratio, you just kind of know. So in order to check the rest of the assumptions, um, what we'll want to do is run that multiple regression procedure, and that's because it will give us the output of our residuals, which allows us to then um, look at the like normality of the residuals, homogeneity, and homoscedasticity. Okay. So let's click regression, linear regression, and move over the dependent variable. Okay, so regression, linear regression. The dependent variable here is VO2 max. Okay. What's next? Next thing we're going to do is put the independent variables, heart rate, age, and weight, in the covariates box. Okay. Now, um, it's a little, oops, I am not doing the right thing here. VO2 max, age, weight, and heart rate in covariates. Okay, I wish it said independent variables, but what it really means is like all of the things that we're going to use that might co-vary when predicting the dependent variable. Okay. All right, what are the options we need? All right, there are a bunch of assumptions, unfortunately, for regression, so we're going to break this down into kind of three parts. So we're going to think about independence of cases, linearity, homoscedasticity, and multicollinearity. And we're going to put in that Oxford comma because it's my favorite. These two things are not one thing. They're two different ones. Part two will deal with 
outliers and part three will deal with normality. Okay. You can kind of get all of these at once, but we'll walk through them one at a time. So do I have independence of observations? So here we're actually going to ask for the outlier information at the same time. Okay. So let's click on statistics. Okay. And then what we'll do here is click on Durbin Watson and case wise diagnostics. Now we'll warn you that this has changed just a little bit. So let's take a picture here. It's under residuals and we have slightly different options. Okay. So they've changed this and updated it to now include the Durbin Watson test, which we'll use for independence. But then the case wise diagnostics, our new option is standardized residual, which gives us approximately the same answer we had in these guides before. It's just that there are new options. So when we ask for that Durbin Watson, it adds it up here to the model summary box. And that has been updated as well. Oh, these tables in Word are so hard to get rid of. Like, why does Word hate me so much, right? There we go. I think we all feel this way sometimes. And we're really interested in this number here. And it didn't change, it's just the box looks different. So the Durbin Watson statistic here is 2.29. And if you remember from the last video, it can range from zero to four, and we want things that are close to two. Okay. And that means there's no correlation in the residuals. Sometimes it's called autocorrelation. And the idea is that my data should be my own and it should not be related to your data. I remember we measure relation with correlation. You see our value is very close to two, so we probably have independence of residuals. There's also a newly added p-value on this statistic. Okay. That's greater than 0.05 as our alpha, so it's probably okay. okay. Remember, we don't want our assumptions to be significant because that would be significantly bad. Okay. All right. So generally with independence, even though there's a test, a lot of times people don't run the test. Um, because you just have to kind of know in your research design that you did this correctly. So when people took the study, they weren't helping each other. Or um, when you had participants come into the lab, they each filled out their own survey, that sort of thing. So a lot of times that we just kind of um, know that through our research design that we've made participants independent. Okay. Um, if you do have correlated errors, you have to do a, a different type of analysis. All right, so is there a linear relationship between the variables? All right, so what we'll do is come down here and it's under uh, uh, plots. Okay, I think in our old one, it was under assumptions checks, but now it's under plots, so I'll update that. But it's the same pictures that we're interested in, residuals versus predicted, residuals versus histogram, and QQ. So we want all of those. Okay, so what you do here is click on plots. And it's the same basic idea. I'll update these pictures in a little bit. Okay. So if our residuals, do, 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 and our residuals versus predicted, make this sort of square plot, then we probably have linearity. Okay, we don't want a, um, a rainbow shape or any kind of curved shape. So if it looks like a chair or a rainbow, that's bad. Okay. Um, and you can see that when looking at this plot, which we'll use several times. Last time in the correlation or simple regression plot, we just looked at the, the X versus Y. Well, now we have multiple X's versus Y, so we kind of have to, to include all of those. And so this plot we'll use a couple of times for homo, homo okay? And you don't want this kind of plot. We made this one in SPSS, but you don't want this rainbowy plot. Okay. So linearity is okay. So we, we have independence. Linearity. What about homoscedasticity? Well, it's the same picture as the one we were just looking at. And I'm going to cut and paste it again just so that you can see. And it's actually slightly different. Yes, yes, yes. Max trying to keep me safe from pasting a picture. <laughs> It was really the same picture. This just gives us slightly different X and Y outputs. All right. So what we're interested in seeing is that there is sort of a, um, 
a rectangular relationship, so to speak, where we don't want any kind of like V shapes or megaphones or um, weird bumps in the data. So I always joke about like no rainbows, right, for linearity, no cheerleaders for megaphones, right? and no raining. We don't want a weird spread of the data. So what I could do to kind of help myself understand that is what we would want here is a sort of like a square. It's not square, that's a rectangle. I'll get this right one day. Um, where there, most of the dots kind of fall in this kind of um, equal spread shape. Right? Instead, what we might find, if we draw a line around the data, okay, and let's see if I can get this. I can't draw this line perfectly because I'm I'm the math person, not a artist. All right, so I'm trying to make the line fatter. <laughs> Let's try over here. Yeah, this is how much I use um, Office now, right? Okay, let's make it not blue. Let's make it uh, black. Okay. So we're going to draw those lines around the data. I just undid everything I did. There we go. So let's just copy this so you guys don't have to watch me struggle with Word. Uh, all right. So we're going to draw a line. And this is a little bit... V is shaped, it's not terrible. Right. And so we want to see that the data still fits this kind of blue area, and it's pretty close. I mean, it's not perfect over here on this side, we're missing some dots down here, but that's pretty close. Okay. My um, joke here is always be nice to these plots. But this is mostly homogeneic, okay, or homoscedastic. And that the idea of homoscedasticity, as a reminder, is that the spread of the variance is equal all the way down y, okay, these are our predicted values, for all of the residuals, okay? So the spread is equal down y and x, basically, in these plots. So the spread is the same all the way down this graph. Okay? You don't want triangle shapes. That would be bad. And there are some ways to fix this, not a whole bunch of good ones, but mostly it requires switching to a different type of regression. And so what we're saying here is that this one is homoscedastic, which is one of my favorite words, um, because it's pretty much the same. So I, I, I used to have students draw these kind of squares around it, and if you get that kind of um, rectangular shape, you're probably okay. If you're getting kind of a Dorito chip shape, that's not good. All right, so what's another one? So let's see what we've checked. Independence, linearity, and normal. Uh, we have not done normality. I lied to you. Independence, linearity. Uh, that was homoscedasticity. Let's also think about multicollinearity now. Okay. So multicollinearity occurs when you have two or more variables that are highly correlated. So the this is the problem. Okay. The assumption is actually called additivity. We want each variable to add something to the equation. And if it doesn't, they're multicollinear. And essentially this idea is that um, two variables are basically the same. So why are you using both of them? Just use one of them. So we can look at the correlation coefficient between the IVs only. We don't care about the correlations between the IV and the DV. That's part of the actual regression. That's the question of regression. But here is the correlation between the IVs. And we can also look at what are called tolerance or VIF values. So here we're going to click on, we've got most of this open. Um, let's see, where did we say it was? Oh, we can actually run this in the correlation window. Or, so that's one way to do it. Or I think that's part and partial, so that's not what we want. Model? Can I see the correlations? Covariance matrix. Hmm. No, okay, we'll do this in correlations. I thought there was an option here. I got excited about part and partials here, but let's do correlations. So that's under regression, correlation matrix, only your IVs. Don't confuse yourself by putting in your DV. Age, weight, and heart rate. Now remember, we can also do display pairwise table. That's a, such a great way to um, read these. 
So you can either read the kind of triangle shape one or um, we talked about this in the correlation section, the display pairwise table, which only shows, it kind of shows it to you in a little easier way. Now, significance is maybe not so important here, um, but we just want to look at the actual physical numbers for them. Okay, and Word has taken over on this table. It does not like me. So we're interested in more of the, just the number. And what we don't want to see is really high values. Okay. So we can check that none of the independent variables have correlations greater than 0.7, and we can see from that table that none of them are greater than 0.7. Okay. And I actually would not suggest at all running the DB. Um, so let's take this bad boy out because I think it confuses students because um, you want you look at all of them and you forget, don't look at the DB. So pretty much don't run the DB, okay? So move over the variables and then click on display pairwise table. All right, now to get tolerance and VIF values, we'll still use our um, regression that we had going. So I'm just going to click to go back to it. And that's here under collinearity diagnostics. And so we'll see these now added to our model table. Okay, so let's go back. Under co uh, coefficients here, what we can see is the collinearity the diagnostics have been added here. It also adds some stuff down here we're not really interested in. We're going to focus on this piece. Okay. Um, so what are those scores? Well, tolerance values okay, and VIF are kind of like a seesaw of each other. They're reciprocals. Okay, so VIF is one divided by tolerance. So you only need to look at one of them. So you can pick which one your instructor likes. Okay. Um, we want tolerance values to be less than 0.1, which is a VIF of greater than 0.10. Oh, I'm sorry, that would be bad. Uh, if tolerance is less than 0.1 and then if VIF is greater than 0.10 or greater than 10, that would be bad. Okay. Here our tolerance values are all really high. And what you can notice if you check out the correlation table, okay, so age to weight here and age to heart rate, age in general has a really high value. Okay. And that's a reciprocal kind of the opposite of how those correlations work. So these are low, so tolerance is really high. Okay. And those are also a seesaw. Um, they're not perfect, like I can't do any subtraction here, but the idea is that if your correlations are really high, the tolerance of each other. So the way I remember tolerance really is how much do you like your siblings? Okay. So like if you, um, like, cause you're really, you're related to each other, right? Um, and so like, it's just how much you can put, the variables can put up with each other in the equation. Okay, and that value is really low, they can't put up with each other. There's a low tolerance to having both of them in the room at the same time, or both of them in the equation at the same time. Okay. And VIF stands for variance inflation factor, which means it's how much is like kind of is happening, like causing the equation to change, so to speak, if I add both of them in. Okay. So they're kind of, they're opposites of each other because tolerance is like how much the equation can tolerate having both of them, or VIF is how much it's like wildly varying by including both of them. Right. All right. So all of our tolerance values are greater than 0.1, uh, the lowest one being 0.979. Okay, that was a typo. So we can be confident we don't have collinearity. Okay. The best thing to do when you do have multicollinearity is just to take one of them out. Okay. So you look at the two that are very highly correlated and just take one out. And that is where having both of these tables are really useful. So let's say one of these numbers is really low. Um, usually they'll go low together because they're the two that are the problem. Okay. And so then I could come over here and say, okay, it's age and weight. It's not at the moment, but pretend for me. Let's say we're including two measures of IQ or something. Take one of them out. So do we have any outliers? Well, probably not. Okay, but let's go look at our case-wise diagnostics, see how it's empty. And that's because we don't have any outliers. If we did, you would see a number here, which indicates the row number 
for the case that's the problem. All right, and that standardized residual is still three standard deviations. Um, just the, the visual of this has changed. Are the residuals normally distributed? So I think we're about to hit the last one here. And you look at this histogram and or a normal QQ plot to determine this. I like the histogram the most. You want here in the standardized residuals, and this is towards the bottom here. We just haven't scrolled that far. Okay. Um, for the distribution to be centered over zero and to be kind of mostly between two and two. Okay. Um, so, and we've also added that a density curve and we want it to look mostly normal okay and that looks pretty good that's a pretty pretty it's a pretty picture <laughs> um, the other thing you can do is look at these qq plots i often use these for linearity if you have curvilinearity you'll see some some problems here but you want the dots to line up on the line okay? and um, be nice to the plot out past two because it's very hard these are z scores remember to predict scores that are that far away from the mean okay? it looks pretty good so this is how you can tell it's fake data. It's because everything looks nice, right? So the normality is good, linearity is good. And so I just kind of want to remind, like we kind of did these in, a, in an order a little bit different from the top. So we're going to go back up here to the top and just kind of remind you what they are since I didn't start here. Okay. Um, and these are the answers. So here are the assumptions, right? Are um, two or more independent variables are Continuous or nominal? Yes. Are dependent variables at least interval scale? Yes. Okay. There's a linear relationship? Yes. We looked at that residual scatter plot to make sure there were no rainbows. Okay. There were no outliers? Great. Case-wise diagnostics. Okay. We had independence of errors using the Durbin-Watson statistic. Okay. Homoscedasticity, we looked at that residuals plot and it was fairly uh, rectangular. The residuals are normally distributed. That's our last graph we looked at and we didn't have multicollinearity. Okay. Well, we kind of regrouped these at the bottom based on what um, options we had picked because some of them go together, like checking linearity and checking homoscedasticity is kind of in the same plot. All right, and that is the thing that always takes the longest. So now let's do the fun part, which is actually running the regression. Okay. So that's gonna be way down here. Sorry, that was the other one. Here we go. So first question, um, what can I answer with a multiple linear regression? Well, I can think about how well I can predict. So I can determine the proportion of variance in the DV that I can explain by my IVs. So how good are we at predicting VO2 max um, with age, weight, and whatever that last one was? <laughs> okay. I can use that equation then to predict new values. And that's really handy um, as you get into analytics because businesses are very interested in that question, right? How do I predict new values? And so are scientists. Um, and then how do we determine which variable is the most interesting one? So I generally kind of lump this into the overall equation. How good is my prediction overall? And then the individual coefficients. Which one is the best one at predicting? Or do I have several very good ones? Because it could be that the overall equation is predictive, but only one of the variables is carrying the weight. So you can think about this like a group project, right? If there's only one of you doing the work, then you're the coefficient that's working. All right. So first we want to think about if the regression model is a good fit for the data. Okay. We can use the multiple correlation coefficient, but I, which is R, big R. I'm going to suggest R squared because that's more common, which is the percent or proportion of variance explained in the DV by the IVs. And then for that, we can think about the statistical significance if that value is more than zero, because okay? if you predict none of the variance, it would be zero. Um, or the precision of the predictions from the model. Okay? So there's a lot of way to do, ways to do this. Most people use B and C here. So the core uh, the R squared values and then the um, F statistic with a P value. Then we'll understand if the coefficients are any good. And generally we'll look at their T scores. Okay, there is a T statistic and their P values. And then if we think they're important, we can interpret them by using their coefficients. 
All right, so how well does our model fit? Can we predict VO2 max? So that first box is called model summary for a reason. So this is the overall model. And we're really interested generally in these two. Okay. So R is, um, is the multiple correlation coefficient. This is the relationship between the predicted score and my actual score. R squared is just the transform of that into a, a proportion of variance accounted for. And that's what this whole box explains to you. So it is a correlation between Y, my actual score, my predicted score. Okay, so it runs from zero to one. And zero means I cannot predict Y at all. And one means I've predicted Y perfectly. And I've probably done something wrong because that would be very hard. Okay. This indicates a moderate level of relationship if we use those correlation rules. Okay. Much more popular model, as it says here, is R and R, R squared. Okay, I see most people use regular R squared and not adjusted R squared, but this is a measure of the proportion of variance explained by the independent variables in this case. Um, this is over and above the mean model. Okay. And what the mean model means is like the best guess, if you know nothing about age, weight, or whatever, your best guess at predicting people's scores is the mean. So why the why um, the mean of y? So if you don't know anything else, you could just guess the mean, and you might be pretty good, okay? especially if people are all fairly close to the mean. So there's not a lot of variance in the data, but you could probably do better than the mean. So if we can do better than the mean, how much better are we doing? And that's the purpose of r squared. Okay? And of course, I forgot to turn on do not disturb. So let me turn that on real quick. I swear, it's like every third video, I'm like, oh, darn, I forgot. All right, so uh, this section here just explains what could be predicting just with the mean. So I won't bore you to death by saying this again, um, but our R squared here is 0.15. Okay, that's 15% of the variability in VO2 max can be predicted over and above just guessing the mean. Okay. That's not bad. That's pretty good. People vary a lot. There are probably a lot of other reasons that people um, have differences in their VO2 max. Okay. And it's sometimes very hard to predict people, right? And um, that generally is considered somewhere in the medium range. Okay. Depends on which uh, version of R squared your instructor uses. Okay. Not mathematically, but the interpretation of that coefficient. So sometimes people like to adjust R squared because it has been shown to be a, a little bit optimistic, right? So it sometimes is considered a positively biased estimate, which means that it tends to overestimate just slightly. Okay? And so some people use the adjusted version, which tries to control for the fact that we know this overestimates a little bit. So that tells me practically, so practical significance sometimes is what this is called. Like how much does, is, are we, you know, how much better are we doing than the mean? Okay. If you want to attach a p-value to that, you can use the ANOVA section. Okay, let's find that ANOVA, it's right here. Okay. So it's the second box down. So overall then ANOVAs. Okay. And what the ANOVA box tells me is this is still, um, uh, remember that ANOVA is a special form of regression, but we're still using uh, like ANOVA, like the test that we did a couple videos ago. Uh, but we're still using the F statistic to determine. So we can kind of um, use the kind of ANOVA formula to calculate F. Uh, so now it's how much are we predicting versus how much error there is. So in our stats wrap video, it's still this idea of like difference on the top over error on the bottom. Um, but here we're just seeing like how much better than the mean are we doing, right? Um, our p-value is less than 0.05, which we've picked as our type 1 error rate. And so we would say that this would be significant. Since, since 002 is less than 0.05 here. Right? So we're better at predicting than the mean. And the null hypothesis for this test is that R or r squared, okay, really, since they're just squares of each other, is zero. So we can't predict at all, right? And uh, the alternative is that it's better than zero. Okay. 
and since all this stuff is squared, it's only you can't do a two-tailed test. So we're pretty much saying, oh, since it's squared, it has to be bigger than zero. And we could write this just like we wrote our ANOVAs before, and then we want to plug in that R squared value at the end. So a quick reminder what all these things mean. F is that we're using an F test or an F statistic. Three is the regression, the degrees of freedom for regression. And that's three because we have four predictors, right? We have the intercept, which most of us kind of ignore. <laughs> and then we have um, age, I can't even, I literally cannot remember. Age, heart rate, and weight. Okay, so you'll see there are four lines here. But remember that degrees of freedom is kind of so, uh, scores minus one, so it's four minus one here. And there's a confusion that people think this is three because there are only three predictors. Well, that works out because we, we tend to ignore the intercept. The intercept is a predictor, okay. um, or well, it's not really a predictor, but it is an important part of the equation, the unstandardized equation. And so it's uh, still in minus one. Okay, so it's one, two, three, four, minus one. Okay. Here, 96 is our residual or error degrees of freedom. Okay. And that's based on the size of the sample minus predictor stuff. Um, the F score here, 5.5. Okay, this is a measure of, right, our mean squares. Okay, ratio of our predictiveness with regression versus the error. And then our p-value based on that F statistic. So overall, our model appears to be statistically significant and maybe practically useful. So here's the equation. VO2 max is equal to B naught or B0, which is our intercept plus the coefficient times age, plus the coefficient times weight, plus the coefficient times heart rate. Okay. That's really awesome. So we could plug in the numbers for that and use that as a predictive equation. So I could guess someone's BO2 max given all this information. Okay. And a lot of um, apps or watches will do this, like my watch will provide this information. And that's because I've entered most of this and it knows my heart rate because it measures it. Right. And then you might use some other statistics as well. Okay. So from that, how do we plug and chug those numbers in? Here are all the B values that we're interested in. So it says unstandardized. The implication here is that that's unstandardized coefficient B. The standardized coefficient is beta. Okay, there's a blank here because when you standardize, you're taking out the mean. Okay. Then we have our um, statistic on whether or not these numbers here are different from zero. All right, so now we're interested in knowing which coefficient is carrying the weight. Are they all predictive or is there only one or two of them? Okay. So there's a lot of descriptive text here that, I can, that you can hang out and read, um, but I think you're mostly gonna be interested in here. Let's just um, make the font just a little bit smaller so it all lines up a little bit easier to read. There we go. Um, Mostly here, we're going to kind of come over and see which ones are, are significant. Okay. So it does not appear that heart rate is doing us any good. Now, a lot of times people will focus here on the B value itself. But remember that B value is based on the scale of the data. And so um, heart rate is going to be a lot more variable than age. Okay. So it might have a, small, a smaller number because it, you know, it can increase more steps. And so the unstandardized coefficient is really good for interpretation, but don't compare them directly to each other. So I cannot say that this one is five times more, or that's three mathematically, sorry, three times more, because they're on different scales. Uh, the standardized coefficient allows me to think about them in standard deviation form. These are like the z-scores version. Okay, I could compare those directly. But this first one is not important. Okay, it did not help us in predicting for our equation. The second one, age here, did. Okay. Uh, so for every one unit increase in age, so for every year of life, you're getting a 0.19 decrease in VO2 max. So as we get older, our VO2 max capabilities decrease. The next one is also weight. That's also important. Okay. And now they have the same coefficient here. So for every one extra pound, we get a decrease in VO2 max by approximately the same amount. However, it's really interesting to look at the standardized coefficient because that to me says that weight is 
is doing more for the equation. Okay. So it has a larger standardized coefficient, a larger z-scored one, beta, um, which implies that it is a stronger predictor. Um, now, remember, we've talked about p-values. Don't say something is more significant. But instead, we can use this column to kind of help us determine, like, which one is a better predictor. Okay, I always tend to say stronger predictor, right, because this one's still important according to our p-value rules. But this one's doing a little bit more of the work okay, in predicting. So this is why you can't compare these directly, because they're on different scales, right? Weight and age are on very different scales. All right, so all of that that I just went over <laughs> is down here. Now, if I filled in, so let's say you have a, an assignment question that's like, what would the VO2 max be if you were, you know, 18 and 135 pounds, that kind of thing? This is how you do it. So you'd fill in those B values, and then you would just calculate in the math. Okay, so we uh, plug and chug. <laughs> so this is a kind of... I, don't, I always wonder if there's like a, a, a version of that in other languages, like do those words rhyme <laughs> in other languages? But uh, the idea here being that we would fill in the, the age, weight, and heart rate of a participant to guess their VO2 max. All right, one other thing that you can add that's not in this guide that I will add that I think is important that your instructor might ask for are these part and partial correlations. So I'm going to add those real quick. Click on coefficients, copy that. Let's talk a little bit about those. So I kind of hinted at how I can compare which coefficient is, is useful versus better. They're like, wait, okay, where did the part and partials go? Oh, it just puts them in a new box. Oh, okay. Well, sometimes it sticks them out on the end. I guess that's SPSS. Go away. This one, okay. So I, what part and partials are, are measures of effect size for each coefficient. Okay, so they're tied to this box. And I actually expect them to be in this box because that's where they appear in SPSS. But here in Jasper, they're in their own fancy box. Okay. So part and partial correlations are sometimes covered, sometimes not. So if your instructor has not talked about this at all, you can like la 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 and ignore me. But they're this idea of how much variance is accounted for controlling for all the other variables. Okay. And so this allows me to, to look at the statistics here of like how much is, is going on when all the other ones are controlled for. Okay. And there's a distinction mathematically between what happens with part, partials and what happens with part this part thing should be called a semi-partial. That's how it's generally referred to in books. Partials are the partials. Okay. And you can tell because partials are usually larger unless they're all zero, okay, mathematically. I like to look at partials here because that it's easier to interpret personally than part or semi-partials. It's this idea of like controlling for everything else, like taking all the other variants due to weight and due to heart rate okay, and due to the overlap. How much does age account for? Okay. But we have to remember, so you want to square them if you want to think about variance. Okay. So this first one, age, that's a correlation. So 0 0.2 squared, I think is 0 0.04. <laughs> okay, yeah. So that's about 4% of the variance in VO2 max is um, accounted for by age, controlling for everything else. Okay. And so these numbers here will also um, kind of like mirror the, the standardized coefficients. They're not the same thing at all, but they give you the same feeling, right? So heart rate was the lowest, age, and then weight. And I don't know why they're in a different order here, but heart rate is the lowest, age, and then weight. So notice how these kind of mirror each other. Okay, it's not perfect. Um, it's not always true, but weight here is 0.33. Okay. And that's about 11% of the variance. Okay. Now those do not add up to R squared. So it's very tempting to think, oh, I'll just add all these up and it will equal R squared. Uh, that's not how this equation works. It controls for the overlap. So sometimes age and weight overlap. 
right? So as we get older, our metabolism slows down and maybe we gain weight, okay? Um, so any of that overlap is not included. Big R squared thinks about like the total amount of variance, okay? These partial correlations or PR squared thinks about like, okay, take out everything else due to every other variable and that includes the overlap. How much is this one accounting for on its own controlling for everything else? Okay. So these don't add up. Very tempting, but they don't. Okay, if they do, they do, but they're not supposed, they aren't supposed to all the time. It's not a way to check. Okay. And I'll uh, add a little bit more here on PR squared for people who are just reading along. All right, so how would I report this all together? Remember the rules. First, tell us a little bit about the uh, study. So a multiple regression was analyzed. Oh, I hate when people say run. Okay. Was analyzed. You can say was run. This is just an error in particular thing, but was analyzed to predict VO2 max from age, weight, and heart rate. Okay. The data was screened for assumptions. So talk about your data, uh, your uh, assumptions checks. No outliers. We met all of our assumptions. Yay. Okay. So all assumptions of, let's do here, were, ooh, were, were found to be met and no multicollinearity was present. Okay. <clears throat> and that tweak here, so all assumptions of these were found to be met and no multicollinearity was present, it's because multicollinearity is not, like, is the bad thing, right? So no multicollinearity. You could say you met the assumption of additivity. I'm not sure your instructor is going to be that particular, but this would be a bit more like statistic-y flow-wise better. Okay. Uh, now, so we've done, tell me about the data, tell me about the study, tell me about the assumptions. Next one, tell me about the model. Okay. So the model was statistically significant. Okay. The multiple regression model statistically significantly predicted. Okay, I don't Love the word statistic here, but um, that tells us that it's not practical significance, right? Uh, and then our p-value, and this is actually just regular r squared and not adjusted. So remember, point more, about 15%. Okay. All three variables added to the prediction. And that implies that they're all significant, but they weren't, were they? So what we should say is regression coefficients and standard errors can be found in table one. Heart rate was not related to VO2 max, while age and weight both negatively predicted, such as increasing age and weight lowered the VO2 max. So I really like this sentence because that tells you the practical usefulness of this. So as age and weight go up, VO2 max go down. Okay. And you can put them in a table because this is already nicely APA formatted. Woohoo! Now, if your instructor wants you to put those values in the write-up, and they don't let you do the table. Let's add those, okay? So heart rate was not related to VO2 max. How I might report that, if I can remember my APA style, is T. Our degrees of freedom for T are the second degree of freedom here for F. Okay, that's not really ever told anywhere on the box, but this the residual degrees of freedom. We would report the t-values, negative 1.33. Okay. We would report our p-value, which was 0.187. Okay. And if you want to, from the box above, I could report that uh, pr squared value. Sometimes people put b in here as well. Oh, come on now, italics. Don't be rude. There we go. b equals, what was it, negative 0.06. And we would do that for all three of them. Okay. Now I've got the square brackets here because sometimes people use square brackets when they're reporting it in kind of like what would normally be parentheses. But since these already have parentheses, sometimes people like the square brackets to um, be less confusing. Okay. So we do the same thing here. Well, age, okay, so negative 0.19. And I realized here that this. I did a dyslexia and I switched them. There we go. <clears throat> T is still 96. It hasn't changed. So 2. Point, wait, H. Make sure I look at the right one. Yeah, 2.12. P is equal to 0.037. Okay. And then weight 
one more time. So let's see here, it's 0.18. And you'll want to pay attention to what your instructor wants because sometimes they want you to report beta instead of B. Okay, and then you'd put a beta here instead of B. It's the only thing you change really. And then our p value is less than 0.01. Now, table's much easier because <laughs> Took me forever to type that but in case your instructor wants this like what was the coefficient in APA style that's how you do it okay. all right so this video covered all of multiple regression talking about assumptions working through the analysis and then we added a couple of little other things that you might see in a, in a report um, such as the PR squared values okay. so that covers part 11 regression and the next and final section of our draft videos will be over chi square and um, that will now move us from parametric to non-parametric statistics.